Thank you everyone for joining our session about how to make ice cream using ice and vanilla ice. My name is Oren Brigg. I'm a system architect at Cisco Israel, leading a team of system engineers over here in the country and leading programmability for the countries of EMEA South. I'm Ramona Arena. I'm technical solution specialist at Cisco, and I have the pleasure to work full time with our Cisco APIs and SDKs. The reason for this is I work for the TV DevNet team which focuses on providing programmability expertise and also custom sample code development to show the power of programmability to our customers. Like, just like any other solution or product, let's start with the question, why? Why did we, de we develop vanilla ice? Why is even ice used with customers? So ice is sort of a Swiss army knife. It can, can be used for several different use cases. It can be used for device administration using radius or TACX. It could be used for BYOD, gas access, network access control for Cisco SD access, context exchange, and many more reasons. Now, the other pa part of the why is who's actually managing ICE. For the majority of the use cases of ICE, we'll see the group of either network engineers or security engineers managing ICE. And we're talking about very seasoned, very experienced people that know ICE in and out, and they can operate whatever kind of use case and whatever kind of configuration needed to be applied on ICE. But when we talk about ICE as a NAC solution, Handling, handling the endpoints of the organization, in many cases, the engineers would like to offload that portion, especially when something goes wrong. Um, they won't, don't want to handle any specific issue with any endpoint in the organization. And for that, they'd like to offload it to the help desk where you probably can find uh, part-time students or let's call it less skilled, less experienced people. And for them, the quote I got from uh, some of my customers were, if I'll give them more than four menus, they'll get lost. And ICE, to be honest, ICE has a few more menus, just slightly more than four menus. And we want to be able to offload those troubleshooting and those issues to our help desk. Please help us. So with that, I think that's enough being said and enough slides. Let's move to the demo and show you exactly what ICE is, uh, what Vanilla ICE is all about. This is the login screen onto Vanilla ICE. The reason that we have a login screen is just because we don't want anyone with access to the service to be able to query and get information out, uh, out of ICE. So what I'm doing here is entering my ICE credentials and the beauty of it is in Vanilla Ice, I don't have any logic and I'm not storing the credentials here. So I'm basically using those credentials to use the query Ice's APIs. As, as long as the API query gets back to me with an okay, I know these credentials can be used to query Ice. And that way I don't need to handle password complexity, refreshing it and whatever kind of database and policy in password policy you might have on Ice. It's just the same username and password you have on Ice will work seamlessly here. Logging into Vanilla Ice, we get a welcome screen, and then we can do several things. First of all, uh, let's say we want to check what's the status for a given switch that we have in the network. I don't expect um, that part-time student to remember all of the IP addresses for all of the switches they have in the network, and for that we have device list. Clicking on device list, we get a list of all of the switches and all of the network devices that are configured on ICE. Because, first of all, I don't want to manage the inventory and update vanilla ice every time someone is adding a switch or removing a switch from the network. And none, none of the switches can work with ice unless they're configured as a network access device on ice. So querying the NAD list out of ice will give me the updated list of switches that we have in the network. Now, I can choose one of the switches here. I want to choose a Campus Fabric 1 for example, and I want to query that device. What's happening in the background using PyATS, I'm running a few commands against that switch, composing this table that we have right here. So here I can see I have three different interfaces. Some are connected using MAB and profiling. Some are connected using .1x. For .1x, I can see which username is connected here, what are the IP addresses, VLANs, SGTs, and so on. But if I remember correctly, I remember seeing four addresses here, and I miss—I think I'm missing one of the endpoints. 
For that exactly, I have the endpoint query where when I'm trying to search for a specific endpoint, so clicking on endpoint query, I can search the MAC address was, I think it was this one, 8077, clicking here, and then I can quickly get a result from ICE, where is that endpoint connected? So I can see the reason I didn't see it on uh, the campus switch is because this endpoint is connected to a switch called branch number one, port 104, it's connected with .1x, username is marketing, and I can find all of the relevant information for that specific endpoint. Now, going back to the switch, which uh, I queried before, it was the 203, I saw that one of the endpoints there is not authenticated properly. I can see here that one of the endpoints, this one, is connected, is connected through MAB, but apparently we didn't recognize it or we didn't fit any one of our profiles because it got a deny, IP deny all access list. So basically this, this endpoint is on the network, but it's, it can communicate with anyone. And you might relate to this scenario where the specific endpoint that has some sort of an issue just happened to be one of the directors or the VP at the companies, and they're running at you shouting the fact that they need to get on a WebEx call in five minutes and they need to get access to the network right now. They don't have the time to wait for you to understand what happened to their profile and whether it's antivirus uh, definition that is not updated, they need access now. For that exact usage, we created the functionality of the concept of a voucher. A voucher is a digital piece of information that allows the endpoint to basically bypass all of the security checks, all of the security mechanisms for a limited amount of time, get them on the network in order to check what's happening there later. So we have a director or a VP on the line. He's pissed. He needs to go into his WebEx meeting right now, and he doesn't have the time for you to figure out what's gone wrong. So this is where the voucher comes into play. Let's add a voucher. Here, I'm adding the MAC address of the end of the relevant endpoint. It was 8612. And here I can choose the duration for how long I want this voucher to exist. I want it two hours, uh, two hours, eight hours, 48 hours. I can name whatever kind of voucher I, I want here. And I can have a voucher group because a voucher could be either a PC with certain privileges, or it could be a printer with different privileges, or it could be a security camera and so on. So I want to add this with a group A, meaning a computer. I can alter the names, obviously. I can click here on add. And what this does, this creates in the background, adds a certain rule onto ICE. And now this should get the endpoint onto the network. Now, if I go again to the same switch, 203, and I'll check the status for that endpoint, now we can see, okay, wonderful. Now we can see the same endpoint, but now we can see that the VLAN has changed to uh, 1022. The SGT is now SGT number four. It has an IP address and the access list is gone. So now that endpoint can communicate with the network. Now, the concept that we added to the voucher is this concept of timing. I gave it two hours, and that means in two hours time, the voucher will automatically be raised. Now, with all the respect, because we do not have two hours and we will not wait two hours, what I can do here with the voucher is simply revoke it right now. Let's click revoke. This has deleted the voucher. And now if I'll try the query at once again, 203, I should see the access list back on. Let's see, wonderful. So the voucher has expired. The endpoint has lost its IP address and now is back off the network. So. One, once the voucher is activated, you get immediate access. Once it's revoked, you get kicked off of the network. Hopefully during that time, our endpoint technicians can get to the VP, the WebEx call is over, and now they can treat him with, uh, with confidence. The way, because this is a feature that does not exist on ICE, let me just for a second explain what, is, what happened here. So when I created a voucher, or in order to, for the vouchers to work, I have a, uh, a rule on ICE. This is the UI of ICE 3.0. If you haven't seen it, wonderful. I highly suggest you, you that you'll upgrade your, uh, your ICE installation to 3.0. On the policy set, I have a rule for those vouchers. So I'll go here and here I have it. I have router, uh, router rule A. And this says when 
an endpoint is coming from a group or is belonging to a group called AAA vouchers, get it onto the network and give it an SGT called employees. Now that AAA group is what we call an identity group that we have here. And you'll see that right now, that identity group, AAA vouchers, you'll see that it's empty. We don't have any active vouchers right now, so it's empty. If I'll add the voucher again on vanilla ice, let's add it a six here we go using the ISIS APIs right now I'll refresh it here and all of a sudden we do have this endpoint so endpoint exists then it means it will fall on the rule for that endpoint and will receive the privileges of employees on the SDA network and once I click revoke then going back here refresh all of a sudden the endpoint is gone and then it will fall on the uh, access deny rule that's it for the demo. Let's go back to the slides. Wonderful. So that was vanilla ice and that's what it looks like. Now, how did we do it? First of all, I heard and I talked with some of my customers understanding their requirements. We talked to several stakeholders and then just trying to understand what exactly are they doing with ICE today and what's missing for them. And without those conversation, we would have never thought about the fact that ICE engineers just want their to offload their work to the help desk and the fact that uh, the help desk doesn't want something very simple. They do very little work and they require very little information from ICE, but that information they want to get it in a very simplified way. So we got all of the requirements from our users and understood what exactly are the requirements and what are the challenges for what we want to create. Then we started reading the manuals. We explored ICE's APIs to understand which API can be used to gather every piece of information that we need to get the, our business logic working. The third part was experimenting. Personally, I like to experiment with Postman. It just makes my life very easy playing around with the APIs and making sure that I'm getting all of the information I'm looking for. And only then, after I know what I'm looking for and I know which APIs to use using Postman, then we get to the coding part where we stitch all of those API calls, manipulate the data, parse it, and eventually create a, a certain flow which results in the vanilla ice that you saw just now. Now, I don't know if you notice, but um, ice had REST APIs already in 2011, when REST API was, let's say, it was not as popular as it is today. So because of it, starting or until ice uh, read out, um, until ice 3.1, ICE had several different APIs. We have one API for the ERS, the, um, uh, we had one API for the UI, we have another one for the MNT for the logs, and another API for the PX grid. Now, we understand that, and that's uh, because of the history starting back, going back 10 years ago. Um, and that's why starting ICE 3.1, we consolidated all of ICE's APIs and we now have a single API gateway for all of the APIs, a single persona. Everything is now based on the open API standard. Everything has Swagger documentation and creating vanilla ICE for ICE 3.1 will be way, way, way more, um, more comfortable and easier than it was creating in two previous versions. So if you're thinking about uh, going DevOps and automating um, processes that you do on ICE, I highly recommend check out the ICE 3.1 sandbox that we have on the DevNet sandbox. It's free of charge, and you can play with uh, and you can play with all of those functions. Um, now, worth mentioning, I can handle Postman, I can handle Python, but front end. That was way outside of my league. I my uh, my expertise around front end are close to none, and that's exactly where the collaboration between developers and in this case Ramona came into play. So when Owen reached out to me, he already created most of the back end code, but he was specifically looking for help with the front end and also with creating the whole web application based on his back end code. Our teamwork started with a short initial call. In this call, he first of all explained the story behind Vanilla Ice to me, but also what kind of expectations he has regarding timeline, outcome, and responsibilities. In this call, he also shared the mockups you can see on the slide here. 
these mockups helped a lot because they show what kind of UI elements Orange wanted to have in the front end. And more important, they showed what kind of backend functions are corresponding to the UI elements we can see on the mockups. This helped to save a lot of time. So it's now I didn't need to understand every detail of the backend code, but we're just able to jump to the function itself and connect it to my front end. And another really great point about this mockups was because we were now easily able to talk about vanilla ice and our outcome expectation expectations. In the development phase, we additionally relied to a shared Git repository, and we really made sure to write readable code. For example, by adding self-explanatory method names and also documentation. Putting all of this in place, we were able to really efficiently work on vanilla ice without checking back constantly with each other because some questions arise. Here you can see all the components of Vanilla Ice or the web application Vanilla Ice. First of all, we have the web application. For this part, I did rely on the framework or Python module, which is called Flask. Flask makes it really easy to get started and also helps a lot with easing the development process overall. One of the reasons for that is that it includes further modules that are really handy in the development process. For example, the Jinja 2 template engine which allows you to define and render pages dynamically or the WebSock toolkit that provides the functionalities to talk with WSGI server or also basic development server. So starting from that, I had the backend from Orin. I just put it um, as part of my Flask application. So just by doing so, I had all the backend functionality ready. That means also the connection to ICE via our APIs and the direct connection to a few network devices via PyATS. So for the front end part, I use Jinja 2 templates and the Cisco UI kit. I will talk a little bit more about the Cisco UI kit in a second. First, let's look a little bit more in detail with the Jinja 2 templates. So basically, Jinja 2 templates contain static HTML, CSS, and JavaScript code in combination with Jinja 2 elements. These elements can be, for example, variables, statements, or expressions. And the important point is, that these expressions can be or are replaced and executed as soon as we render the template. So with Jinja 2, we were able to create dynamic pages based on the information we retrieve from Orange backend. And last but not least, I did add some Python code to connect Orange backend with my templates and also to make sure that the part time student is able to access our pages by clicking on the link or a button, also by typing the URL in the, in the field in the browser. I shortly mentioned the Cisco UI kit on the last page, but I really want to go a little bit more in detail when it comes to it. So the Cisco UI kit is an initiative from Cisco to simplify the design and the development of applications with Cisco corporate design. Therefore, it provides not only predefined templates for designers, but also the Cisco UI pattern library for developers. And thanks to the Cisco UI pattern library, my life was way easier. Thanks to that, I didn't need to start from scratch when developing the front end. Instead, I was able to use the predefined HTML and CSS UI components the UI pattern library provided. This did not only make my life way easier because it just came with the Cisco look and feel itself, but it also made it possible that I was able to create the whole front end within days. So let's uh, summarize the main takeaways of this presentation. So I really hope, or we really hope, that you saw that our Cisco APIs allow great customization, automation, enhancement to create a solution that perfectly fits your specific needs. But keep in mind, you don't need to start from scratch. So Cisco DevNet offers a lot of learning materials, use cases, code that you can reuse, and a great community that can help you out. So there is no need to reinvent the wheel, but feel free to tweak it to suit your needs. And last but not least, if you have a customer with Cisco ICE in place, think about positioning vanilla ICE to put the cherry on top. We also uh, came with some references for you, so always feel free to check out in case you are interested in the specific topic we mentioned here today some more. 
And at this point, I can only say thanks for sticking with us up to this point. So we truly hope that the presentation about vanilla ice will encourage you to begin your journey, perhaps in programmability. If you already did so, perhaps it motivates you to engage some more in other programmability projects or to overcome a challenge you perhaps have. And in case you already finished some of the projects, be free to share them with us in a definite exchange.